Many companies in follow will do their best to turn a profit at any expense. They forego ethics, morals, and humanity to further their bottom line. Companies like h, h Tools, whose human resources department implemented inhumane policies, or Hornwright Industrial, who pushed for automation of the Appalachian region while also using deadly force to break the strikes against it, or vault Tech, who constructed and plotted hundreds of human experiments inside their fallout shelters all come to mind. But were there any good companies? Ones that didn't treat other human beings as expendable. Ones that did their best to provide a quality product or service to better the lives of American citizens. I know it may seem crazy, but yeah, there were a few good companies who weren't complete maniacs. Let's go over some today. Vimpop Vimpop Incorporated was a local yet popular soft drink manufacturer operating out of Maine. These guys were as clean as a whistle, no bad press here. The company was founded in 1931 by Herbert Reed who initially sold the beverage as a sort of health tonic. As time went on, the drink garnered much local success, eventually being regarded as the state's official drink of choice, its residents drinking more Vim annually over the better known Nuka-Cola. Still, the business was not all hunky-dory, as in the years before the Great War, Vimpop was nearly $3.29 million in the red. Nuka-Cola was aware of the company's dire financial situation as they had composed a team, including a current Vim employee, to sabotage the smaller soda makers in an attempt to force the sale of the company so that Nuka-Cola could buy them out. Despite this, Vim would do its best to hold on, coming up with a genius marketing strategy, the Vim Ambassador Campaign. Vim commissioned a couple sets of company-colored power armor suits. These ambassadors would go to local communities and events to hand out free bottles of Vim, answer questions, and direct potential customers to their sales distribution team. However, this campaign was met with a series of crimes, and while Vim couldn't prove it at the time, it was believed that Nuka-Cola Corp was the culprit. The crimes included an ambassador being assaulted at a bar, a suit of power armor being stolen, and several delivery trucks had been shot up. Still, Vim refused to succumb to Nuka-Cola's suspected doings, and continued to try and find ways to improve their own business. Their next ad campaign titled Escape into Adventure was a success, and they were hopeful about their new fishy-flavored drink, Captain's Blend. But as soon as things were starting to look up, the nuclear bombs started to come down. Wilson Automatoys Wilson Automatoys is the next not-so-bad company, at least they were for a while. Wilson Automatoys was founded by George Wilson and Arlen Glass in 2042 with one goal in mind, to help children dream a better future. Both had a passion for toy making, spending countless hours working and grinding to fulfill their one altruistic goal. And while this did take a toll on their relationship with their families, their hard work would pay off with the release of the Giddy Up Buttercup. The robotic horse toy was a massive hit with kids. Not only would it make the company millions, but it would also put a smile on the face of every child that could afford the toy. However, Wilson and Glass's families grew ever more frustrated with their father's never-ending work. Glass neglected his wife and baby daughter, and Wilson missed countless birthdays, a graduation, and his own wife's funeral. In an attempt to reconcile with his son, Wilson hired his son Mark to be the vice president of Wilson Automatoys, and eventually when George was ready to retire, he vacated his position to Mark so that he could take over the family business. But Mark never forgot how his father abandoned his family, his son, his dying wife. And so when Wilson Automatoys started seeing yearly losses, this didn't really affect him all too much. While Arlen Glass began to brainstorm ways to improve the brand, creating collectibles, producing promotional models, and coming up with a product for boys, Mark had another idea. Mark, without Arlen's knowledge, entered a bid for the federal government's new Scythe program. The Scythe program intended to repurpose civilian factories to aid with munitions manufacturing. Mark's bid was accepted, and soon five assembly lines that once made a children's horse toy were now fitted to make landmines. At the next board meeting on October 20th, 2077, Arlen was surprised to see a military representative as well as hear about the company's new product. Feeling betrayed by his business partner's son, Arlen became enraged and security was forced to remove the toy maker. His next attempts at trying to make Mark see reason and not go through with the military's proposal was only met with more security, and eventually his termination from the company. 
Arlen's firing was seen as many to be the death of Wilson Automatoys as he was always considered the heart and soul of the independent toy company. But all of this turned out to be for naught, as Wilson Automatoys, like most businesses, would be destroyed by the Great War. I should note that while one could argue that Wilson Automatoys is not good because of the owner's own neglect of their families, I believe that the goal of the company was still good in nature and it wasn't until Mark's secret dealings that the company itself took a more nefarious approach to business. Beaver Creek Lanes Beaver Creek Lanes was a popular bowling alley in Maine. It was owned and operated by a group of friends that just plainly loved the sport. Thomas Davis, a Beaver Creek Lanes employee, United States Marine, and Bar Harbor Bowling League champion, was informed of his imminent military deployment in early 2077. While on duty, Thomas's destroyer was sunk and he was considered MIA until early July. Thomas managed to survive through his injuries, was given a medal for his bravery, and received an honorable discharge from the military. However, he sustained some sort of spinal injury that would ensure he would never walk again, let alone bowl. As the back-to-back -back bowling league champion, this devastated not only Thomas, but also his friends and co-workers who had always been rooting for him. So, one day, before Thomas's planned return to the bowling alley in December, Thomas's friends Mark Wilson and Matthew Stevens came up with an idea. They began the development on a device that would allow Thomas to bowl without the use of his legs, a bowling gun. Their first design was to use part of the ball return and a strong motor attached to a board. This was an immediate failure as it had only ever managed to sand parts of the ball down. So they consulted with another friend and co-worker Jacob White. Jacob suggested modifying a fat man catapult, and so that's exactly what they did. They used some of their connections to locate a supplier out of an old surplus store and traded a few tanks of gasoline for an old fat man. And thus, the striker was born though the group never really managed to adjust it for a safe and proper firing speed. But what mattered was that it was complete, and come December when Thomas was set to return to work, he would be able to continue his reign as the bowling champ. However, like most happier stories in Fallout, this one too has a sour ending. In October, a freak landslide proceeded to cause massive amounts of damage to the Beaver Creek lanes. The building's insurance, on the advice of a structural engineer, determined the building to be unsafe. It would either need to be entirely rebuilt or undergo some costly repairs. And so, on October 20th, 2077, Matthew Stevens would hand out everyone's final paycheck. Beaver Creek Lanes would be closed indefinitely. Garahan Mining And last on the list is Garahan Mining. The Garahan family were one of two major families in control of Appalachia's mining industry, the other being the Hornwrights. And of the two, the Garahan Mining Company was definitely the lesser of two evils. Where the Hornwrights invested into automated mining robots that would put hundreds of blue collar workers out of a job, Garahan Mining Co. instead invested into better equipment for their human miners. Former lead researcher for the original T-45 power armor, Harold Frost, was hired by CEO Vivian Garahan in early 2075 to develop a set of civilian power armor that can improve mining efficiency. The result was a black titanium made suit dubbed the EX-17 Excavator, or just Excavator. The suit would protect workers from rockfalls, airborne contaminants, and increase the speed at which miners could work. By April 3rd, 2077, three excavator suits were fully operational, never had a breakdown, and held the record for the most ore extracted in a single day. In a region that was obsessed with automation, the excavator suit was a rare W for human workers. Determined to keep fighting for human workers, Vivian Garahan challenged Hornwright Industrial to a mine-off, a mining competition. Vivian Garahan's three excavator suits against Daniel Hornwright's auto miners. Whoever could extract the most amount of ore in 24 hours would be the winner. Vivian's confidence was well placed as the excavators were matching the auto miners output right until the very end. By the end of the day, Hornwright's auto miners managed to secure victory by 1.85 tons, less than a single truckload. And while Garahan suspected the Hornwrights didn't play fair, at the end of the day, it didn't really matter. All of Appalachia just witnessed man lose to machine. All anyone would talk about is the efficiency and the effectiveness of the auto miners. Support for automation grew amongst executives and the government. 
Garahan mining stocks tanked, and Vivian was forced to scrap the company's plans for mass-producing more sets of excavator power armor. With Garahan facing loss after loss, it wouldn't take long for Vivian to step down as CEO, and for Garahan Mining to start leasing their own auto miners from the Hornwrights, doing their best to salvage their tanking business. Their worst fears, an automated Appalachia, came true. And there you have it, a soda company that was trying to make an honest dollar and represent their small community, a toy manufacturer that maintained its singular, altruistic goal, a bowling alley that would go out of their way for their friends, and a mining mogul that tried to stop automation. Four fallout companies that weren't all bad. In a world where capitalism and corruption reign supreme, these four companies did their best to fight back against the machine. In some cases, literally. Anyway, that's all from me today, folks. If you liked the video, be sure to share and subscribe. Have a good rest of your day. Cheers. Mark, do you know why toys are important? They help children dream. They let them imagine a better future beyond this blasted war. They give them hope. Thirty years ago, I met a man who understood that. Your father and I built Wilson Automatoys on that hope. He poured his life into that hope. And now, you've thrown it all away. Sold it in search of a quick profit. It's still not too late. If you won't do it for me, for your father, for the company, then please do it for the children.